school closures, unfortunately, is not just a problem uh, in Oakland. This is a part of a nationwide strategy to destabilize and destroy public education, especially uh, in our major cities, especially in our major cities with uh, high populations of people of color, black and brown students. It has been a systematic attack across the country. So we've seen the same thing happen in Oakland, in Los Angeles, in Chicago, in Detroit, in New Orleans, in New York, in Philadelphia. You can go down the list of cities. Uh, and if you're not going to go down the list of cities, you should definitely start with what we used to call the chocolate cities, um, especially cities that had political leadership or was seen to have political leadership that was black or of color. We were the first cities that were attacked. School closures in Oakland really can de be divided into three phases. Okay? So, phase one kind of starts when we were taken over by the state of California in 2003. Now, before the takeover, um, Oakland had problems then. And one of the problems Oakland was really experiencing in the late 90s into the early, I don't even know what we call that decade, into the early zeros, um, <laughs> is we had... Uh, a number of schools, especially in East Oakland, that were bursting at the seams. We had a number of schools that were on year-round schedules. They were on schedules of three months on, one month off, just so they could squeeze more students into those schools. And it was only in certain neighborhoods this was happening. And one of the responses that came from the community was a small school movement, where a lot of people in the community were saying, it is not fair to have our kids packed like sardines into these schools. We need to break up these big schools into smaller, more manageable schools. A lot of that was led by OCO. OCO is a faith-based community coalition in Oakland, Oakland community organizations, really uh, based in East Oakland, the Fruitvale and East Oakland neighborhoods. Um, they've, done, they've worked on a lot of issues uh, throughout their existence. They're one of our older organizations in Oakland, um, everything from immigration and housing rights to education rights. Um, I'll get to when they got more problematic. Uh, so uh, there was this uh, small school movement. So what schools were doing is schools were approaching the superintendent saying, hey, our school's too big. We need to break up into smaller schools. You need to grant us small schools. And so we had a series of schools that were granted small schools. Um, that was when uh, Elmhurst Middle School was broken up into smaller schools. That is when... Uh, Manzanita, even though it was a little bit different, was broken up into two smaller schools. That is when we have a number of schools in Oakland where uh, multiple public schools share the same campus. Most of those were done during this small schools movement. But what happened is it, it, was, it was growing the number of small schools. And they reached a point where the superintendent said, we can't afford to, to allow everyone to do this. Because it was kind of a in my opinion, a bad model for small schools, because it wasn't a school within a school model. Each small school then would have its own principal, its own custodian, and there, there was a lot of repetition of services, which meant it cost more money. So at the time, uh, Superintendent Chaconis started saying no to some of the schools, to OCO and some of the schools that wanted to become uh, small schools. That was the birth of Aspire Charter Schools. And so what happened was the schools that were told no, they couldn't be small schools, then they decided to go and get a charter and to become a charter school. And that was the birth of Aspire Charter Schools and really the charter movement in Oakland. And it gets confusing because there was this overlap between small schools and charter schools. And, and it gets a little, a little murky in there. But then what happened right after that was when we got taken over by the state of California in 2003. And so charter schools had already kind of started in Oakland. We had a couple of community-based charter schools, like the first one down in Jingletown. We, we had a couple of charter schools that uh, had been turned down for small schools that were starting to form. Then Randy Ward came in as the first state administrator. And it was open season in our schools and on our schools. And what the state administrator did when our local school board had no authority and we as a community were disenfranchised is Randy Ward started closing schools across Oakland. A lot of the schools, the public school facilities that charter schools are in in Oakland, and they've been there for a while, we can trace that back to Randy Ward, the state administrator, closing our schools and giving those properties over to charter schools. 
One just quick example. Um, I was working, uh, at the time Randy Ward came in, I was working at Maxwell Park Elementary, um, which used to be uh, off of High Street. The neighboring school to us was Sherman Elementary, named after Elizabeth Sherman, the first black female administrator in Oakland. One of the first schools that Randy Ward closed was Sherman Elementary School. And so what he told us at Maxwell Park at the time is we had to absorb those students into our school. And then he said Maxwell Park would always be safe because it would be the last school left to anchor a mega district. When Sherman Elementary was closed, that property in that school was then given to a brand new charter called Montessori Charter School. Now Montessori Charter School though had some extra political juice and this is just the, the tie-in for everything. Okay, when Randy Ward came here as our first state administrator, one of the people he brought with him to Oakland and put in the district was Jonathan Klein, who was Randy Ward's chief of staff. Jonathan Klein went on to found Go Public Schools with the Rogers Foundation. So he was brought into the district by Randy Ward. Uh, then that urban Montessori charter school that was started at Sherman Elementary was founded by Jonathan Klein's wife. So just to, just to summarize there, uh, we get taken over by the state. The state administrator closes our public school and then gives that property over as a charter school to the wife of his chief of staff. And it was open season from there. Okay, so from 2003 to 2009, we were under state control. That is when we just had crazy school closures. There were, but I, I recognize there's a lot of people who weren't maybe in Oakland at that time. Let me make it clear. There was protest to all of these decisions. There were parents with picket signs in front of schools going to offices. Um, but the state told us that we had no authority and they were just going to do it. Okay? Then we started to get back partial local control in 2009. And that's when things kind of shifted to a different phase because there was no longer a state administrator who could just dictate these things. So in 2011, 2012, we had our mass school closures here in Oakland under our democratically elected school board. Where at the end of 2012, five elementary schools were closed. Okay, uh, Maxwell Park, Santa Fe, Lakeview, Marshall, and Lazier. Okay, there was huge community opposition. I mean, we had a famous meeting here uh, at Oakland High where there were over a thousand people here in the auditorium. They stopped letting people in. There were so many people here. But in the end, we could not stop those five schools from being closed. But what we did do by the pressure we put on the school board in the district is we got them to throw away their plan of closing 25 more schools over the next five years. Okay? At the end of 2012, when they closed the schools, we also had a 17-day sit-in and occupation at Lakeview Elementary School, where one of the fathers at that school, Joel Velasquez, had been saying for six months if they closed his kid's school, he was just going to sit there the last day. And he did, and the community joined him. Um, it was great. We even had a, a school bit going on there for two weeks. Um, but in the end, we got raided out of there. But we had sent a message to the district that they could not just wantonly close our schools anymore. And it's really scared them off of those plans to have mass school closures since. Okay? But then we shifted into a new phase. Okay? Starting in about 2013-14, um, our school board started to pass policies to make it easier to close schools. And this was at a time when uh, Gary Yee and David Kakashiba were running the school board. And at the end of that year, Gary Yee actually became the interim superintendent when Tony Smith fled over. Um, and so under Gary Yee as superintendent and David Kakashiba as board president, they wrote and passed what they called the Quality School Development Policy. And that was a policy written and approved by our school board that included a clause that when we are doing uh, school improvement, and school conversions, that policy allowed charter schools to apply to take over schools. And it was the first time we had a policy from our school board that specifically allowed charter schools to come in and take over our schools. And it was the start of what we're still going through now. It's been a five-year process of the school board trying to create a process and a policy to allow charter schools to take over our schools. 
And so what uh, Kakashi Ben-Yi also did at the end of that year is they're the ones who hired Antoine Wilson to be our superintendent. Okay, Antoine Wilson was hired unanimously by our school board. They went and recruited him out of Denver to do specifically what he did. And so when Antoine Wilson came here, first Antoine Wilson um, rewrote the strategic plan unilaterally and got that passed. Then Antoine Wilson started a process which he was calling the call for quality schools. And it was based on the quality school development policy. It was a process that said if a school decided they wanted to go through a redesign process, that they would put out a call to the whole world and anyone can come in and write a proposal to run that school. And they had set up a committee that would select who gets to take over that school. Okay. But we didn't let it go on too much. We stopped most of it. But as a side note, that is how Lafayette uh, Elementary got taken over by Kip Charter School and given a 40-year lease. That was through the call for quality schools process. Let me say that again. Kip Charter School has a 40-year lease on Lafayette Elementary on our public wow. schools. Mm -hmm. Okay, so after the call for quality schools, that's also where we got, this is, these policies are all tied together. And what really started to happen is we kill one and they just give it a new name. <clears throat> we we uh, politicize people to another one and they just have another name. So after the, the quality school development policy, there was the call for quality schools. Then Antoine Wilson started calling those schools intensive support schools, which then became the Elevation Network. And it got more polluted and, and, and kind of murky each time, but that was all based off of this premise in the quality school development policy that said certain schools, if they were identified, could then be converted into charter schools. Okay? Which then led us, after Antoine left, the last parting gift Antoine gave us um, a month before he fled to DC was he started the blueprint process. Okay, which was the latest effort really to try to get the community to say, yes, you can go ahead and close our schools. But it didn't work there either. And what happened with the blueprint process, there was a community advisory group established, and by the end of that committee meeting, the community advisory group stood up at the school board and said, we don't, we don't have any report to show you, we don't agree with this, and our recommendation is that you restart the process and do it in an authentic way. But instead of that, then Shanti Gonzalez, two months later, decided it was a good idea to rewrite the blueprint policy, and that's what we're under now. So I'm going to say that again, because I get a little mad about it. Shanti Gonzalez wrote the policy that they're using to close our schools. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm still mad about that. And so this year, I'm going to fast forward to everything because I'm getting the sign. That brought us to this year where all of a sudden there was a citywide plan put out. Okay? Now, the citywide plan has now disappeared. And it was only presented one time really at the school board. And what that was, it was a draft plan that the school board did that showed that they planned on closing 24 schools over five years, 24 public schools, 24 of our 86 public schools over five years. The reason we haven't seen that report again is because there was huge pushback against it, okay? And thank you, Bernie Sanders. Even Bernie Sanders tweeted that it is not a good idea for Oakland to close 24 schools. Um, but we have all of this still floating out there now. So we have cohorts for the blueprint process. Uh, there's some people here from Kaiser who were told this year that their school was on a close and that they'd be sent to Sankofa under the next cohort in the blueprint process. Mm -hmm. But because of the community response to that plan, the school board's backed off and they don't know what to do now. They came to Manzanita and we're telling Manzanita we're going to move some people here, some people there, some people there. That plan's disappeared. But they're still waiting for these. They're still trying to figure out a way to get us to accept school closures. Okay? So just two things real separate, just two kind of separate areas I just want to speak on real quickly, and then we're going to have a panel of people to give some of their first-hand testimonies of what they've been going through recently in terms of school closures. Okay. We had uh, what was done to Roots this year. Now, in my opinion, I wouldn't actually call it a closure. 
and I know some people would argue with me about that. In my mind, a closure is closing the public school and making that school available either for sale to developers or to, to, to a charter school. I say what happened at Roots is, and it's not any better, but it's a displacement. They're moving one school out to allow their neighbor public school to just expand. It doesn't make sense. It's not okay. But I wouldn't really call it a closure. And the thing that was really hard about Roots is not only was it only a six-week process between when the school was notified and the school board voted to close it, that was done outside of any established process. It wasn't a part of the blueprint process. They didn't have the benefit of a year of planning. And so we still don't know really why that was done to Roots in that sort of way. Then the other thing that we have, which is a separate thing, is Prop 39. So very quickly, for two minutes, Prop 39 was a state proposition. And since I'm going to tell the truth, one of the problems with Prop 39 is it was an agreement between the California Charter School Association and CTA. Mm -hmm. CTA. Uh, California CTA. Teachers Association. CTA. And the, the agreement was uh, CTA was pushing Prop 39 which was really about lowering the threshold to get uh, local property taxes increased to pay for education. So Prop 39 was to lower it from a two-thirds required vote to just a simple majority. California Charter School Association said to CTA, we'll support that if you add this little clause that says, um, we get first use of any underutilized classrooms in your schools. That unholy alliance uh, led us to the way Prop 39 works now. And so Prop 39 technically says, underutilized space in our schools must first be made available to charter schools. Mm -hmm. Which maybe wouldn't be too bad if we had a school board protecting our classrooms in our schools. What's happened with the way that it works is our school board turns over whatever classrooms they want to them. They come up with crazy utilization of <laughs> We know in our schools we don't have all this underutilized space. It is a political process, and the term utilization is a political term under Prop 39. And Oakland, uh, OUSD, has been under suit from the California Charter School Association since 2016 for our Prop 39 offers. And so that means there are secret negotiations behind closed doors mm -hmm. between the school board district staff and the charter schools in Oakland to allow them to move into all of these schools. Okay, and so um, I know Howard uh, right now is trying to figure out how they're going to deal with a Prop 39 offer at their school that's already been approved that will be turning over classrooms in Howard to a charter school next year. And by doing that, force resource and the special day class and some of those other classrooms into closets and into shared spaces. Okay, but Prop 39 is a state proposition. And really, the only way to change a state proposition is through a proposition. And so hopefully now, we have new uh, charter, hopefully, control laws moving their way through uh, the state legislature in California. If we can get controls on charter schools and make it where they can't appeal to the county and state anymore, mm -hmm. and we have more ways to deny them, that will be how we can stop Prop 39 at the front end. The other thing about Prop 39, and then I'm, and then I'm done for now, is we need to, if, if people want to fix Prop 39 and how it is interpreted in Oakland, because other cities it's interpreted different ways, we need to start working on that now. And so the mistake that we usually make under Prop 39 is there's a Prop 39 season. The offers have to be made by the school district in March. Uh, there has to be final acceptance by May. There's this springtime window when this all happens. Usually, we wait until the list of schools possibly affected comes out, and it turns into this big last-minute fight. Mm -hmm. What we need to do if we want to stop Prop 39 is we need to start working on it now. Real quick clarifying question. The school board writes the formulas, not the state, for how what is considered underutilized? Yes. Okay. So each year, um, OUSD comes up with a different utilization formula. I would love to see OEA um, maybe get a little more aggressive in fighting against Prop 39. And also, I'd love to see OEA push on the question of how do you let non-union teachers come and work on your site <coughs> as a union teacher? That seems like a clear violation of labor laws. Mm -hmm. 
And the last thing that we all need to do in terms of Prop 39 and getting control of our district is we need to be in charge of the processes and the utilization formulas. So hopefully we will start uniting more together and kind of pushing from there.